Hello and welcome to the Unscathed Life Podcast, a podcast that inspires you to push beyond adversity and rewrite your story. On the show, I'll be sharing some of the core principles that underpin Unscathed Living, a life I define as the intentional manifestation of your highest self, regardless of circumstance. My guests will embody on skate living and will be sharing relatable practices that have helped them stay advancing despite adversity. My name is Toma Moswagu and I am your host. Let's get started. So today's podcast sheds light on an issue which impacts more women across the world than, than a lot of people realize. We're talking domestic violence. And sadly, there's been a steep rise in cases across the world. So for instance, in Nigeria, where I grew up, a staggering 23% of women have been victims of physical or sexual violence committed by a spouse. And due to how sacred wedding vows are held, women are encouraged to stay in such relationships, even at the risk of their own lives. So how does a woman fare in a society where her marital status may mean more than her own life? So my guest today is a brave and courageous survivor and for this episode she will be sharing her story to enlighten us. She will share how she navigated and overcame a seven year long abuse at the hands of her ex-husband. Evie has three daughters and she'll be sharing what she did to come out and overcome the adversity of domestic abuse. She's a warrior who embodies what being unscathed means. I'll make four points before we get into today's episode. And the first is this. This episode is for you if you see yourself in any way in Evie's story. I would like for you to know that I see you. I hear you and I hope you take strength from today's show. Do something. Don't suffer in silence. Don't let fear hold you back. You are worthy of love and the life you deserve is waiting at the other end of a decision that only you can make. The second is that after recording this episode, I was moved. I was so moved, in fact, that I set up a GoFundMe page in support of Evie. She is currently raising her daughters, her three daughters, all by herself without any financial contribution whatsoever. And she's also currently out of work due to the COVID pandemic. So I would like to encourage you to also give if you feel led to do so. I have linked the details to the GoFundMe page onto the show notes for this episode. The third is that today's recording includes graphic details relating to physical violence and sexual abuse, which some listeners may find distressing. And then finally, this episode considers a singular perspective. Details have not been verified with any other sources other than Evie herself. Thank you in advance for listening. So thank you very much, Evie, and welcome to the Unstayed Life Podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. Because of awesome. Awesome. So if you, if you want to just kind of introduce yourself a little bit more. <laughs> okay. Um, just as you mentioned, my name is Evie. Uh, I'm a single mom of three. Um, what else? Okay, I'm I'm, I'm a tomboy. Um, I'm a gold mm-hmm. digger too. Um, I read sciences in school, but I skewed off to human resources because I'm really passionate about people, obviously. Okay. Um, the center of my world are my children, and so that's what I do most of my time. I spend most of my time being a mommy. Ah, oh, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely love it. Great, great. So, if you're where are you based? I'm based in Lagos, Sulu, Lagos, to be precise. Okay, 
awesome so for our guests who are not nigerian that's uh, that's somewhere in nigeria um in lagos so um so if you i want to start at the beginning shall we start at the very beginning so you know what have you i kind of alluded to the fact that you have overcome um incredible challenges uh, to say the least and that's putting it mildly i know mm -hmm. uh, but do you kind of want to give us some an insight into you know what what you've overcome what was your your previous story oh okay um let me put it this way um while i was growing up i was more of a go-getter i wasn't one of mm -hmm. those people that uh, wanted to get married if i can put it that mm -hmm. way but um, I bowed down to pressure from my family and I ended up mm -hmm. getting married to somebody that I didn't really know. Um, mm -hmm. A few months into the marriage, uh, the abuse started, a slap here, a punch there. And I mm -hmm. think I fell into that, um, that notion that having a baby was going to make a difference. And so I had my first child and I had a girl and then the problem started, you know, all the um, verbal abuse. You can only have a girl child and all that. I had another baby. I had another daughter and it got worse, you know. Wait, let me, I, can I just understand this. So the verbal abuse was from your husband yes. that you had a girl. Yes. Oh, wow. Okay. Yes. I, I had um, all, all manner of abuse. And then it was later that I realized that I got married to someone that was really very domineering. He wasn't somebody that wanted um, a go-getter. He wanted to be married to a doormat. And I had worked um, almost every, uh, all the, uh, ever since I finished school, ever finished, since I finished the university, I started with Airtel and all that. So I had a good job. But by the time I got married, mm -hmm. I realized that my job also became a problem. First of all, I thought that there was, there was physical abuse. You thought that having a child make it better. Yeah. You had the first child and it was a girl. And you then, it then added on to the abuse that you had because oh, you, yes. you, you announced person that had only would only have a girl so how did that manifest do you want to just kind of elaborate on that a little bit just to make sure that our audience understand you know uh, understand the patterns of okay, this sort I don't of to, my husband was an only son you know and mm -hmm. i also come from a family where i have three sisters and an only brother you know and i didn't mm -hmm. grow up in a situation where having a male child was an issue you know, so when mm -hmm. I had my first daughter, it was as if, you know, I was irrelevant because I could only have a female child, you know, that he expected that I was going to have a son, you know. And so I just mm -hmm. thought, I, I, you know, I pushed it aside as one of those things. <laughs> Maybe he just wanted a, a son as a first child or something, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So I just sort of waved it aside and life continued, even if at any single infraction there's there's a hit here there's a slap there i know how many times i got locked out of my bedroom by somebody that was supposed to be my husband you know and then i had my second daughter and it became worse you know it became worse where my mother-in-law came into it and said they were going to get me all manner of herbs and stuff that i'm supposed to drink it so that my child can become a son and all that and that was when i knew that okay look i think i'm in trouble here because i really didn't grow up in a family where having a son was an issue i've never had that in my lifetime especially because i was a science student and i knew that having a male child had absolutely nothing to do with me yes you know, yeah. it had absolutely nothing to do with me if you want a son you give me a son you know and at a point i got tired of being bearing the brunt of not having a male child and so i lashed out and said look i don't understand what you're talking about you know not having a male child has absolutely nothing to do with me it's what you gave to me that i gave you back so i really can't figure out where this male child issue is and he decided to take the beating to top notch, I, I got beaten constantly. There were days when I got beaten so bad, I couldn't leave my house, you know, and um, a part of it that I try not to talk about, I think I buried that part of my life for a very long time, is the fact that a lot of people don't believe that there's something called marital rape. And I didn't even think that there was anything like that for a while. 
you know but when somebody beats you blue and black and you're you're bleeding and the person decides that is at that point he wants to have sex with you then i know that there's a problem you know wow. i didn't see it as a problem until i left you didn't see it as a problem i just thought you know it was a norm is the the background that we have we were brought up in such a way that some things are taboo to talk about some things are acceptable in our country like a man can never rape his wife I still see that with a lot of people right now, where you, you raise that topic and they tell you that how can a man rape his wife? So what is interesting was how, how long was that normalized for you, that he would beat you and then still want to have sex with you? How, how, how long was that a normal thing for you? That happened to me for like the first three years of my marriage, after my first child and my second child. It became like a norm. I just felt, look, it was one of those things. Because my mom isn't in Nigeria, and so I had only my dad to talk to. And my dad is more of this um, native, traditional people that a lot of things are taboo to him. You know, you can't speak about certain things. And when I mention it, he will tell me, if you, what are you talking about? Will you keep quiet? How can you say that? And I'm like, okay, uh, I guess that's part of it. So I just sucked it up. I tell, I tell a lot of people that uh, there are certain things that I didn't talk about for a while, but speaking about my life has brought out certain things that I buried, you know, far, far away because I didn't want to remember them. First of all, let's talk about how long were you married for? What's the end to end? Um, I, was married, um, I was married for seven years. I got married in 2007 and I walked out on my marriage in 2014. So I was married actively for seven years. And in that seven years, you had three children yeah. and each time you have a child, it felt like for you, the, the, the violence or the domestic abuse will get magnified. Is that what you're saying? In fact, when I had my last child and it turned out to be a girl, all hell broke loose. I got beaten after I came home because I had a cesarean section and my stitches opened. So mm -hmm. his mother gave me some herbs to take. And he's sure I didn't take it correctly because I ended up having a baby girl. So what is the what is pregnancy like for you then? Because with all this anxiety of, you know, the sex of the baby, you know, th there is the pregnancy that some people would enjoy. You, you're pregnant and you're carrying the pregnancy I and you're enjoying it. I tell people that the only pregnancy I enjoyed was my first child because, you know, it was the first one. I really didn't know anything about boy, girl, male, female. It was just that I was having a baby. But after my first child and uh, that you had a baby girl thing came up, I was a bit apprehensive for my second child, you know. And by the time I had a baby girl, I didn't even plan on having a third one. It wasn't in my plan to have a third child, you know. But it was one of those things where um, I actually had a coil and I think the, the beating or the violence that I received must have shifted my coil. And so when I got pregnant, I didn't know I was pregnant for my third child because the space between my second and my third is three years, you know, and it wasn't wow. my plan. I was okay with just two. And I got pregnant for my third child and I have a little princess. That's my, my handbag. I wear like five and six anyway. <laughs> I grew, up, I grew up with sisters and so I didn't see a problem with it. I didn't grow up in a family where the sex of a child was an issue. So can I understand this? Were there, when you first got, you know, you, you guys started dating, were there moments, was there any indication, was there any sign at all? Well, I tell people, um, even now, I tell people now, do not be pressured to get married. We did not date. It was not in my, that's why I said it at the beginning, it was not in my plan to get married. So when my mother decided, if you can't do this, you need to settle down. After all, I got married to have you and all that. Um, I had a family friend that decided that, okay, look, if you, now that you've decided to get married, I have this cousin that also wants to get married. So let me just match make you guys. And so I think I met him, I met my, my, my uh, ex-husband sometime in October. And by January, I was married. Three months? Yeah. Oh, wow. So you didn't know him at all? No, so not at all. When 
Yeah. When, when was the first instance of um, violence? Uh, the first time I saw that was, it wasn't even against me. Um, his younger sister came to our house and I can't even remember what it is she said. And before I knew what was going on, he gave her a very hard resounding slap. And I was like, what? Because I didn't grow up in a family where you were allowed to hit a girl, you know? And so I saw that and I was like, ha, why? And so I backed off and I said, okay, well, she's your sister. If that's the way you guys do it, so be it, you know? And then I will go to the bathroom. I'm not one that likes to see those that scum on the wall. And so I spent a lot of time trying to remove it from the wall. And one day it came and was like, you are wasting all the water and blah, blah. Mm-hmm. And the next thing I heard was a very, resa- whoa, I heard a very big slap. And I was pregnant then. And I was like, ah, <laughs> is this it? Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. I lost the baby in between my first and my second. Whilst pregnant as well. Actually. You know, and when they beat you, beats you and kicks you in different places. And, you know, it, it was hell. It was hell. I must say so. It was hell. So if you what I want to understand, and I, I want, and I think this is really important, you know, for people who may be experiencing this or who may know people who are in this exact situation now, I want to get into that mindset. What, so you, you, you experience the first meeting, what makes you go back? What is that thing that makes women go back to this ex- experience that is obviously very negative, very harmful, very, you know, what is it that makes women go back? Let's talk about that. Okay. Um, I think having been having um, been out of uh, that situation for a while, it's now that I see Clara. I see Clara now because at that point in time, all I was thinking of was, what are people going to say? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What's my family going to say? My mother is going to tell me, if they, you didn't even want to get married in the first place, and so they're not even giving mm-hmm. it any try, you know? And then there was that fear of the unknown okay what are you to do next okay i leave now what happens next but the main thing was that societal judgment i still faced it after i left but i think i was a bit tougher i had already made up my mind but at that beginning you know it was just one year into my marriage was i going to walk away you know everybody was going to say yeah you didn't even try or you know you just it's because she's wayward that's why she's leaving her husband's house kind of thing and so i stayed put but by the time i had my second child the second excuse was if they are staying because of the children you know don't just leave you want them to grow up without a father so there's always an excuse that you give yourself even after i had my third child it was after i had my third child i woke up one day and i was like look i'm i'm, I'm, I'm tired I can't do this anymore. I can't do this anymore. And so the day he came back home one day and said, the day I'm tired, he will go and all that. And I'm like, ha, a, a get out of jail free card. I walked out of that house with only the clothes on my back, nothing else. And the funny part is I just realized that those kind of people, I call them narcissists. All they want to do is see you in pain because when he told me that I could walk out, he held on to my three children. And my last daughter was only two years old. And so I I couldn't go. And so I stayed in my car and I slept in my car for two days until he decided to give me my kids back. I parked my car right in front of the gate so he could see me morning, afternoon and night. And my last daughter was only two. She was crying and all the walks. And I think he just woke up one day and he was tired and opened the gate and said, please come and take these things out of my house. And I picked them up and I left and I didn't look back. Wow. Was that the first time you left? Or did you, had you ever had periods where you left? And- Yes, I walked away and I didn't come back. Every other time, I just sucked it up the way my father said I should suck it up. And I didn't say a word to anybody. The only person I could talk to after my father gave me that sounding was my mother-in-law. And I told her that this was, was what was happening. She, she was even there to have witnessed it like once or twice. And she told me that she went through the same thing. And so it was a normal thing to happen. And so I should just deal with it. And was she aware that you had also had a miscarriage as a result of this beating and she was okay with that? In fact, she, she had witnessed it like twice. Twice she had come to the house in the, under the pretext of coming to sort things out 
and at the end of the day i got a lashing and what what sort of things would would trigger him what sort of things would trigger him to beat you he didn't even need anything to trigger him it could be that the tv was on and it was loud it could be that somebody spilled water on the floor it could be that you know his shirt is hanging this way and it wasn't supposed to be hanging that way i just became a slave in my house you can imagine when you hear a car horn and you're trying to tidy a house that is not untidy because i'm trying to figure out what is the next thing that is going to end me beating? I just need to try and get it sorted now before he walks into this house. And what sort of, um, were there good days and bad days? Or were there mostly pretty much all bad days? Were there any good times? Oh well, no, there were, there, were, there were some good days really because I, I, I've always been an industrious woman, really. I've worked every, I've worked every time, every part of my life until um, I decided to leave work. And so there were days when I would pay some bills and I'm that, um, I, I know how to take, if I'm with you, I'm with you. So I used to shop. He didn't know the size of his shirt. He didn't even know the cream he was using. I was that kind of wife where I will get everything done, whether you ask me or you do not ask me, you know, and he had that, um, he needs to get something sorted and before he has to get it sorted i've already done it so there were some good days there were times when we could gist actually but and i think he was more of a pretender so when we're outside he's trying to play the good husband kind of thing and then when you get back home then i see the monster that i got mm -hmm. married to i should have seen the signs when he decided to cut me off my family because we could go for his family functions but we couldn't go for my family functions and if he wanted to get at me, he would say, yeah, if you want to go, go, but don't take my children. So where am I going without my children? Invariably, I'm supposed to be at home. So I want us to talk about this because this is so key. And I know that it will free somebody because these are all telltale signs of narcissism. These are all oh, yeah. telltale signs. So the I, what you just talked about there, where you said that he tried to cut you off from your, from his family, from your family, because what they tried to do is isolate you. Yes, and because he did that, I had nowhere. It was part of the reason why I stayed because I had nowhere else to go. I had cut my family off totally. I spent half of my time defending him to the point where my family had nothing to say to me anymore. And so when it became so bad, there was nobody to run to, to report. So I had to suck it in. Wow. I didn't have friends. He stopped me from going to work. I couldn't speak with my family. You know, somebody will come back and check all the calls that I made. If he sees any family member's number, what did you tell them? You're telling them stuff about me. You're telling them stuff that is happening in the house. And so it was hell. And so when the problem started, when somebody has cut you off your family to the point where your family are saying, look, leave her alone to deal with her issues, then you you find it an issue when you have to go and report to them because everybody's looking at you as if when we were telling you what happened. Yes. After all, you, you turned us into the enemy. Say we are the bad ones that you cannot see us, you cannot come to our function, so why are you running to us now? It took me years to get back into my family after I walked away. There's even still some friction between one of my sisters and I. Because she was well-meaning, but she, she felt that you, you could not understand that she was well-meaning and she wanted the best for you. Yes. Yes. Oh, wow. Wow. So let, let's, let's talk about the work one because this is another one, right? So there's the family isolation. There is the stopping you from going to work. How, how, did, that, how did that come about? Now, I was working mm -hmm. at a bank, but I was in procurement. And when you work in procurement, you work almost round the clock. He was also working in a bank, but I had been in telecoms for a while before I got married. So when I entered into the banking industry, I entered at mm -hmm. a high level and it became a problem even if we were in different banks. And so there were all those um, silent jab or maybe he gets home and is like, they're coming home late, you know, all that kind of silent jabs. And after a while, I got tired. There were times I couldn't go to work because I had a black eye or my arm was bad. How many times are you going to give that excuse in the office? And so he might not have told me outrightly to leave my job, but 
all the circumstances surrounding it made me leave my job. If you are going to beat me to the point where I cannot get up the next day to go to work, or I'm going to have bruises on my face and my hand that are going to show when I get to work, then you are invariably telling me that you don't want me yeah. to work. And, and was there an element of that as well that was to trigger you being dependent on him financially? Yes, because at the end of the day, you know, when you talked about some happy period, I think the only happy period I had really, where I really didn't have that much stress, I think it was just the month that I resigned, where I was now at home and totally dependent on him. When I have to come home and say, sorry, yo, I need to get paid. Can you give me money? You know, and the joy of him flinging one, two naira to me to go and get paid wow. was one of the... I think the surreal periods of my marriage because we didn't have anything to fight about because I was a doormat. If he tells me to jump, I ask how high. Wow. And okay, so can I touch on another area? What about your relationship with your children? What's, I know your children are quite young, but was there at any point, you know, trying to discredit you as a mother or trying to make you feel inadequate as a, as, 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 as a parent? Well, he couldn't, he couldn't really do that with my children because my children were young and because they were girls, he really didn't have, he didn't really want anything to do with them per se. For him, they were inconsequential, really. So do you think that then, I, I, and I'm just trying to point out something here and I know why I'm asking you this question. Do you think that if you had a boy, that things would have been different? Um... At this stage of my life, I think after I've been out and I've been able to see it from an outsider's perspective, I don't think so. Because these people are built that way. They look for anything to make you unhappy or anything to use as an excuse. Not necessarily the fact, he just held on to the fact that I had girls, but it could have been anything else. Hmm. It could have been anything else. It had absolutely nothing to do with the fact that I had girls or no girls. He would have looked for something else. So do you think that, you know, you talked about the day that you yeah. walked out, right? The fact that he said, okay, be going. First of all, without the children, then eventually he said, okay, take yeah. the children and go. Do you think that if he didn't give you that permission, did you get to that point where you would have gone even without that permission? Do you think that it was the permission? Yes, I would. There were days that I had already decided that, like, look, I'm timing this man. The day he's going to travel, I'm going to put my things in my car. I'm going to take my children and I'm going to run away. But part of what held me back was, where was I running to? Was I running back to my father that was going to baggage me and take me back? Mm. Because my father was of the opinion that you don't walk away from a marriage. It's a taboo. Mm. That even, that even takes me to the point when I even walked away. Uh, you know, these are part of the things that I say will take you back. When I walked away and I had to go back to my father's house with my children, it was the part two of the hell because my father made my life miserable. What? Really? Oh, yes. My father made my life miserable. You know, he was hiding me. So I got stuck in my former bedroom with three children. I couldn't be seen outside. I couldn't come out of my room because he was ashamed of people seeing his, that his daughter returned from husband's house to his house. There's not a lot of things that, that make me speechless. It's, it's, yeah, I don't get speechless, from, but I actually have no words. So, let, so with that now, against this backdrop, you've left your husband's room. You've, three children you've returned to your father's house who who as you say you know made your life hell what do you do what did you do next how did you manage to gather yourself again what have you done to make yourself you know to, to, to come to this point where we're having this conversation you you sound you know relaxed and happy <laughs> um okay this is this is my take i woke up one morning and then I looked at my children and in my children's eyes, I was, uh, I'm a hero. I'm a superhero because it was just my first daughter that mentioned something to me one day. And I knew that, look, I made the right decision. My little daughter then was, um, I think she was uh, seven when we moved out. And she looked at me in my eye and said, mommy, oh. I don't care where we are. 
but I'm happy to be with you. I don't want to be where we are going to be scared anymore and I don't want to see you cry. And so I knew I made the right choice. So what did you do? Well, uh, there were times when I felt suicidal and the only thing that kept me going were my children. And so what I decided to do, I woke up one morning and I put pictures of my children, even in my house now, if we're on video, I'll shout out that showed it to you. I put pictures of my children all around my house. And so once I get up and I look at those pictures and I just tell myself, if you, not for anybody, but for them, and I get up and I continue. And so most times when people ask me, if it was your driving force, I tell them my children. Because in the eyes of my children, they didn't see me as a battered woman or even now that I walk with a limp. My children don't see that limp. My children just see a woman that would do anything to make them happy. So are you working now? How have you managed? What are, what are you doing now? Um, well, uh, that, that, that goes, uh, let me take that to the continuation of my story. After being with my dad for a while, you know, I sucked it up and I decided, look, this man, you're not going to break me. I, I escaped one place where somebody tried to break me. I'm not going to give you the opportunity of breaking me. And so I silently started planning my exit from my father's house. I dusted my certificate. I decided to go back to work because I had stopped working by the time I left my ex-husband's house. And so I got a good job um, as a head of human resources for a company and I was making good money. And so silently, I started shopping for home appliances. I started looking for a house because I had changed my children's school. And mm. so when I got a house, I did not tell my father I was leaving. He just woke up one day mm. and thought we had gone to work and I moved my things and he couldn't find me. <laughs> I moved to my own place, even if I didn't have furniture or anything then, but it was my own place and I could do what I wanted to do without anybody chastising me. <laughs> so that was good enough for me, you know. So I got a good job. I moved to my own house. My children were attending good schools and so life continued, really. I just decided, look, I was done with it. I was done with it. It was time for life to go on. And so I moved on, really. And, uh, you know, in the Nigerian system, they tell you, you have to wait for like two years of separation before you can file for a divorce. So I was just marking time for it to get to two years so that I could file for my divorce and be free with it, you know? And I think after the man started hearing stories of, look, I'm seeing your wife, she's looking so nice and all that. And he couldn't give any more excuses. And one day I went to service my car because I got myself a new car. And as I was coming out of the, the um, garage, I saw a car coming in and I knew he was his own, but I just drove off. And somebody called my phone after two years and I picked up the phone. Ah, if he, are you the one that I just saw? And I'm like, yes, any issue? Uh-uh. Come now, let's have drinks. Really? If you, please, can I just, I, I, I'm have, please, can I just say this? You left for two years and they, he didn't call you for two years. He did not call me. He did not do anything. In fact, I haven't even gotten to the part where I suffered because remember I told you that I walked out of my house with only the clothes on my back. Now I didn't have a job and I had no income and I had three children to feed. And so I would drop my children in school then. I will have um, a pair of shorts and t-shirt in my bag. I will go to people's houses to wash clothes and clean their houses for me to be paid, you know, small change so that I could feed them that night. And the funny part is their father was still working in a bank. He was still making money, but not one day in two years did I see him until he saw me coming out with a new car. And then he was circling like a vulture. Cir you know, all of a sudden, if he, you know, I, I was now going to be treated like a girlfriend. Let's have drinks. Who are you telling you want to have drinks with? What if we had died? It was so bad that my dad, my father had, instead of keeping food at home, my father would go out and buy one pack of noodles and two eggs and tell me to cook for him while I had three children and myself in the house and we had nothing to eat. So I left one bondage to another one in my father's house. Well, what kept you keep, keep still going? What kept you? Oh, look, my, I tell people any day, any time, 
my children are the center of my world as far as i can see that smile on my children's faces it makes it worth every little bit of it because i want you if you can you do me a favor can you speak to women can you speak directly to women who are listening to this who may be experiencing domestic violence right now but they say you know what I, I, where will i go what will i do i don't have anything but what this man gives me how, how can i start all over again can you just speak to me directly yeah. look all i want to tell you is this do not let anything hold you back do not let the fear of the unknown hold you back because it is when you allow that hold you back you will never ever move forward once you take the first step you take the first step and that is the beginning of the other steps that you are going to take because if i hadn't left i wouldn't have gone back to work I wouldn't have gone back to earning an income. I wouldn't have been able to get my independence because if I was still there, I wouldn't have thought of going back to work. Mm. The fear of the unknown holds us back too much. The minute I walked out with not a single penny, the industrious part of me kicked mm. in. All I needed was where to put my head. Everything else was on me. I had two hands. I had two legs. I washed clothes. I washed clothes till my hands were peeling, but my children were eating and they were happy. And I tell people that if you stay static where you are, if you stay where you are, nobody will help you. Because it will be that you are comfortable where you are. But if people see the efforts that you are making, I swear to you, help will come. Mm. Word. Nobody will help you if you remain there. It's more like you are enjoying it. You want to have your cake and you want to eat your cake and still have it. But people saw that I held three children in my arms with nothing, no money, no nothing. But I walked away and I didn't look back. It was a sign that I was ready to move mm. on. I've had instances where I've tried to help people and they run back to the abuser. Yes. And that's why some people don't help. Because they tell you, I'm going to help you now, and small time you will run back. Mm -hmm. But when people saw that I took these three children, and I had nothing, but I was washing clothes, I was cleaning houses, I will come back. In fact, I have a blister on my elbow, because I donated blood to the point where the blood banks told me not to come anymore. And just to put this in context, you are a professional, though. At the point where you are oh, the yes. blood, it's not like you... Oh, my God. I... Yes, I'm a graduate of... Unilag Biochemistry 2-1. I moved into telecoms when telecoms came into Nigeria and I've worked every single day of my life since I graduated. But I had to do menial jobs. You wash people's clothes and they give you something like 500 naira. And I'm happy with that because it's going to put food on my table for that night. Hmm. Okay, so we've spoken to one group of women. Can we speak to the other group? The ones... That, are, that, that, that go back, the ones that remain, why should they not remain? Look, whatever you cannot change will only get worse. Mm. Whatever you cannot change will only get worse. The fact that you left before, when you come back, it becomes times two because they tell you, you have exposed them. Mm. I get to the point where I even ran away and he found me and when I said that I was going to get a divorce and he heard that I had filed for a divorce, my ex-husband stalked me in my new house. I was coming from a function in the middle of the night and he attacked me and used a wheel spanner to break the strongest bone in my body, which is my shin. I had 11 fractures. 11. And every single time he was hitting me with that wheel spanner, all he could tell me is, if I can't have you, nobody else will. And so you didn't want me initially because I had girls. You didn't want me at all. But the fact that I was moving on became your problem. And so he didn't stop at, he didn't stop at just the abuse and me walking away. He wasn't going to let go whether I liked it or I liked it. He wanted me to go and he wanted to hear that I was suffering. But for the mere fact that I wasn't suffering, it became, you know, it aggravated him extra. 
So let me understand this, Sylvia, because I'm 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 lost. So is this after you left completely? Yes. Two years after we had separated, he finally found me and found where I was staying. He came back under the pretext that, look, if you, even if we don't have anything, but I want to be a part of my children's life. Of course, in Nigeria, I don't want to be the one to say, uh, I don't want to be called the person that didn't allow the children to have a relationship with their dad. And so I said, look, this is where we're staying. You can have a relationship with the children, but between you and I, we're done. And so one night I went for a function because I was working for a company that did um, jobs for MTN and MTN was having a program. And so we went for the program. You know, most of these their programs are in the night and I was coming back home at 12 p.m. And by the time I got to the front of my gate, somebody just came out and I thought it was arm robbers only to turn. And I saw he was the one. This is 12 p.m. Oh, should I say 12 oh, yeah, yeah. And so he dragged me out of the car and I landed with my, you know, my legs stretched out. And he was holding a wheel spanner. And he looked me straight in my eyes and said, you think you can leave me? If I can't have you, nobody else will. And he kept on striking my leg. He fractured my right leg. I now have um, iron permanently in my right leg. And that's why I said I walk with a limb. And my children don't even see the limb. All they see is a woman that fought very hard to mm. keep them. And what it, how important is it for your your children to not grow up in that kind of environment? How important is it for them to see? It is really very important because at that point in time, I didn't even know that my first daughter had any recollection of anything. There was a time that when I was in hospital, they had to go and stay with my sister. And she had an assignment she had to do. And so I had to look into her bag, you know, to check for it. And when I brought out the book from her bag, I saw that my my daughter had written, you know, how she's so happy not to live in fear. All the days that her daddy was beating me and I had to come to their room. I did not believe that my daughter saw all that. Mm. And because I have daughters, I don't want them to grow up thinking that that is a norm. Mm. Because I grew up with that notion and I'm not going to allow my children grow up that way. I want them to understand that it is not normal. Mm. It was part of the backlash I received when I started speaking up. Why will you talk about the man? He's your children's father and all that. I said, he should have thought about that and remember that I was the children's mother when he decided that he was going to take my life. We cannot use sitting down and staying because of the children for an excuse because it breaks them. It breaks them psychologically. A child grows up in a house or a home where there is violence. It breaks them. It does. My first daughter that was the older one is now very melancholy. She's into mm -hmm. herself. She likes to be alone. And so I always have to call her and force words out of her mouth so that she doesn't start thinking about things that she shouldn't be thinking of. My last daughter is afraid of me leaving her for too long. Because of the period when I left and I was in hospital for almost six months, I couldn't walk. And so the minute I say, I'm good, mommy, are you coming back? She's worried because I am the only parent she knows. We left when she was two years old. She doesn't even know who her father is. Did you say you were in the hospital for six months? Yes, I had surgery. I couldn't walk. I had to have iron fixed into my leg. I had surgery. I was in hospital for three months first. I had to have another surgery. And so I went back. And so I was in hospital for a total of six months. And, it, it, you know, and, and, and I'm, I'm going to ask this question because I'm conscious that it's not everybody that's listening to this that is Nigerian. But I think the question that will be on their mind is, what is, I mean, police, unco, is that, like, is... Oh, that is the part two of the whole chapter. Now, a lot of people ask me, if you, why did you put your story on social media? And this is what I'm going to say. Now, when my ex-husband got arrested that night, they put it as a, a wounding. And so he got into the station and then it was a bailable offense to them. Nobody looked at the gravity of my injuries. Can I just paginate? So that yeah. night, you mean the night that he attacked you with the spanner on your leg? So yes. Okay, go on. That go night on. when I got attacked, 
Now, my neighbor looked out of the window and saw somebody being attacked downstairs. Then he didn't even know it was me. He just thought it was arm robber. So by the time he came downstairs, my ex husband actually got arrested while I had to be taken to the hospital because I couldn't stand and my leg was bleeding. Mm. And so straight from the hospital, I mean, straight from my house, I went straight to the hospital. And then I found out that he had been arrested. Now, when he got arrested, the police charged him with like um, wounding, you know, mm. just a small offense. And so they were willing to let him go. And what did the Nigerian police say? Hey, after all, now husband and wife matter now. Why they could involve themselves? You know? And so by the time I was in the hospital, I had somebody come from the Lagos State Domestic Violence Office that met with me. And I mm. told them that I wanted to prosecute the case. But I went mm. into surgery and so I went silent for a while. And by the time I came out of hospital, what actually prompted me and aggravated me the most was that I called them to follow up. And they told me that, ah, no, now I thought you had dropped the case. And I said, how do you mean that I dropped the case? They said somebody from my house called and said we were no longer interested in the case. And I asked, who was that? And lo and behold, it was my father. Oh, wow. My father called them and said that the family is not interested in the embarrassment. And so they have gotten my consent. And I told them that they should drop the case and not prosecute anymore. That it was going to be settled amongst the family at that point i knew that if i did not take it up my case was going to die and my story was going to go away and so i sat down in my house when i had gotten home i had to be given a bath i needed to be you know carried up and down i sat down on my bed and i asked myself if is this how the case is going to go is he going to go free and so i made a post on exactly what happened to me and I put it on my wall on Facebook and I pressed send and it went viral. The whole world was talking about my case and so at that point in time the police didn't have a choice but to go on and prosecute the case and ever since I did that I haven't stopped speaking. Ever since you did that you haven't stopped speaking. No. no. Stop speaking. You have a powerful message in there. You have a powerful message. And, I, and, I, and I'm hoping and I'm trusting that somebody listening to this will hear the spirit behind this message. Will hear the words, but more than it, will hear the spirit. Oh yes, I need them to understand that there is life after DV. When people see me now, a lot of people expect to see a timid woman maybe wearing rags and all that but when you look at me and you see how i'm shining i tell people that i was revolting and i now have a haircut i have uh, piercings all over my body and when you see me i tell them that i want people to understand that because i suffered domestic violence doesn't mean that my life ended that in fact my life started the minute i walked away and i told my story mm. You owned your story. Oh, yes. Now, can you speak to the people? This is another group of people. The people who feel shame. People who don't want to own their story. The people who feel that their story taints them. How, speak to those people, please. No, let me tell you. Speaking about what you have gone through does a number of things to you. One, it relieves you. It relieves you. It relieves your mind and then you are free. Two, there is no other shame that you can get when you already speak about the so-called shame by yourself. You're shaming your shame. Oh, yes. Now, there is nothing that you can say to me that can be worse than what I have already said. Mm. So you can't shame me more than I have shamed myself. Mm. And thirdly, the fact that I can speak about it means that I am strong mm. and I am not moved by what anybody tells me. Mm. I tell people that every day. I get mocked every day. I get mocked for being a single parent. I get mocked for the fact that you know, I might not really have and I need somebody to help me and somebody uses that against me. But I look at them and I tell them that I am happy that I can say mine because I know a lot of people that can't say theirs and are living a pretentious life. Mm. 
I have a lot of people inbox me every day. If you, how do you do it? And I say, but you are part of the people that shame me in public. Hmm. How do you come behind to ask me how I'm doing it? And I tell them every day. Everybody says, if you, why are you shining? I say, I am shining because I am free. Hmm. Work. You have no hold on me anymore. There is nothing that I have in secret that you want to say you will use against me. Are you going to say that I suffered domestic violence? I've already said it. Are you going to say that I got kicked out of my husband's house? I have already said it. Are you going to say that I am raising my children alone? I have already said it. So what do you want to say that is bigger than that? And the more we speak about it, the more people understand that it is not a norm. There was a time in this world, in this country, where you couldn't speak about things. And I tell people that it is not that it wasn't happening then, it was that nobody could talk about it. Even this rape of minors, people couldn't talk about it before. And it doesn't mean that it wasn't happening. But the fact that we can speak about it now, everybody feels that this rape of minors is rampant. But it has always been there. But nobody spoke about it. It was an unspoken taboo. Amazing. Amazing. Even you have, you have at least a bestseller book, at the very least. It might be more than... I plan to write a book It someday. might be more than one, <laughs> but you, at least you have a bestseller within you easily easily your story is very impactful it is life-changing it is meaningful and i'm just thankful to you that you you're sharing with us it is so inspiring you know i would oh yes and and when you have children when you have female children like i have i want them to grow up knowing that you can speak up mm. You can't allow something happen to you and then think it is a norm. I grew up with the wrong impression mm. and I will not allow my daughters grow up that way. Mm. We can survive it. You can survive it. If I survived it, anybody else can survive yes. it. Yes. Tell them. Giving up is not an option. Tell them. Don't even look at it as an, as an option. It isn't an option. Because who are you going to leave those children for? Mm. I look at my children every day. My second daughter graduated on Thursday. And everybody was wondering, why was I so passionate about that child? I said, that child started primary one when I walked away, when I had no hope. And I saw that child through primary one till grade six when she's graduating. That child that child is my achievement and my achievement alone wow i stood there when she entered into grade one and i stood there as her only parent when she graduated and that means the world to me mm. and it shows that it can be done it can be done it can a lot of people say single parents cannot do it, but I do it every day and I live that life every day and I get the achievements every day. My first daughter entered into JS1. She has entered into SS1 by my might alone and that of God. My second daughter entered into primary one and has graduated in, from primary six. She's in JS1 now. That is my achievement. My last baby was only two. She's eight years old now and is in primary four. That is my achievement and my achievement alone. I don't need a man to belittle me because I need him to help me. Because that was part of what he was waiting for. He looked at me and said, you are going to come back when you need to put these children in school. But I've done it. And I've done it without you. So I know that people will be wondering, just a lot of people will be listening to this and saying, please, I hope th what's happened to him, I hope he's not. I, I... Oh, yeah, that is part of the Nigerian system. And what I tell people is that sometimes the system tries to frustrate you. If you're not strong enough, you will break. He jumped bail and skipped the country four years plus ago. He's in America now. I wrote to the embassy and got his visa revoked. So he's living in America as a fugitive, but he's moving around. While I am here, 
I've had to have um, surgeries. This is the fourth surgery I've done. I've had to raise my children alone with no support. No support whatsoever. Wow. And what's your relationship now with your dad? Is that, is that healing? Uh, well, I'm trying to work on it now. Um, I went through counseling and part of my counseling uh, take homes is to try and forgive my dad. Mm. And so I'm trying my best possible. The relationship is strained, but I'm trying. Mm. But to say that I will forget the hell, I escaped one hell and my own father put me through another hell. If I say I can forget it, I'm lying. Mm. You'll get there. You'll get there. So one of the things, um, what I call um, living on scale is the highest manifestation of yourself, regardless of your circumstance. And what you have done in the story that you've told us here is just, you have just shown that you were able to manifest the highest version of yourself, regardless of the things that were put in your way, the adversity, the challenges that were put in your way that could have brought you down. Oh, yes, I've broken the boundaries like three times because I remember when I had surgery, they told me that I was never going to work again. Um, and my daughter was graduating. And the day I took my first step after surgery, you know, was the day my daughter graduated. Wow. Wow. And I walked down the podium for her to give her valedictory speech. And the whole school stood still and waited for me to take baby steps to the stage to stand with my daughter. And I knew that after that day, there was nothing that was going to hold me back. If you tell me I can't walk and I take my first step, then there's no stopping me. Today I walk, I drive, I do everything that I need to do. And life must go on. You're a champion, you're a survivor, and we celebrate you. We celebrate you. We celebrate you. We celebrate you for your strength. We celebrate you for showing immense fortitude in the face of unbelievable challenges. You are a warrior. You are unscathed. Your mindset is not harmed. Your mindset is not a reflection of where you're coming from. You were looking at the front. You're looking at where you were going to. And that is how you got there. Unbelievable. Thank you so much for sharing with us today. This has been a fantastic session. And um, I have no doubt that this story will bless, it will liberate, and it will improve the lives of many. So thank you very, very much. Thank you for joining me today on the Unscathed Live podcast. I trust you have taken away actionable practices for living unscathed. You can check me out on my website at www.unscathe.me or on Instagram at tombra.moswago and Facebook at The Unscathe Life. Have a great week and do remember to be resilient in all your endeavors. Bye for now.